This video looks at differentiation from first principles. The previous video then introduced the concept of differentiation and the term derivative. Next we need to look at how differentiation is performed and the derivative computed. We're going to focus here on first principles, that is to show briefly how the main results are derived. So we're not just going to pluck them out of the sky, we're going to derive them. Students who are happy to go straight to the core results without understanding the origins can skip this resource and go straight to number 6. So recap. Differentiation means to find the gradient. In general, this involves some mathematical operations. And a derivative is the result of differentiation, that is a function defining the gradient of a curve. The notation of derivative uses the letter d, it's not a fraction, and you'll see things like this, so dy dx or df dx, or if I use different variables you'll see things like, oh sorry, d dx of f, which is the action of differentiation. What is differentiation then? So differentiation is a process which finds the gradient of a curve precisely at any point along the curve. So we, we could find that dy dx is 1.75 at here x equals 1.5 or dy dx is minus 0.25 at this point which is, oh, so that's minus 1.5 and this is some, sorry I haven't got in exactly the right places here at x equals minus 0.5 and so on. The key thing is you can find the gradient or the derivative at specific values having done the differentiation. So what we want to do is ask ourselves how can we find this gradient in general? Well we're going to start with an estimation. Gradient is approximately the change in y or the change in the dependent variable divided by the change in x or the change in the independent variable. So here's an example. We've got a curve and you'll see there's delta y, the change in the dependent variable, and along the bottom we have delta x, the change in the independent variable. So the gradient is approximately delta y over delta x, and for this case you'll see that gives me this dotted green curve. Now what you're going to say straight away is clearly that does not match the gradient of the curve at this point, where at this point the gradient of the curve is somewhat closer to that. Now, we've approximated the gradient using this formula, and we can see it's close to the real gradient, and if we make delta x small, we get closer. So, for example, if I take these two values, that as delta y, and that as delta x, then you can see this dotted red line down here is getting closer. So if delta x is small, then this approximation is close to the gradient, but it's not exact. So first principles. For a general curve, the gradient can be estimated using this formula. So that's what we've just shown. But it's not exact. But what we can see is the approximation gets better if the difference between the x values is small. So if we had a large difference in the x values, we've got a big error. A slightly smaller difference in the x values is getting closer. A smaller and it's getting closer. And obviously the true gradient at this point is something like this black line. So what we can see is the closer together we make x1 and x2, the closer together we make them, then the more precise this formula becomes. So first principles. For a general curve, the gradient can be computed therefore as a limiting value. So what we're going to do is we're going to find the limit as this delta x goes to zero. So we're going to make the two x values get arbitrarily close together. So we're going to calculate, for example, this could be y of x plus delta x, this value across here, and this one across here is y of x. And this distance is delta x. And what we're going to do is let that delta x get smaller and smaller and then of course the y of x plus delta x moves towards the curve. So 
if you take a point, this point for example might be x plus delta x, y of x plus delta x, and then you've got x, y of x down here, and what you're going to do is basically plug these into the formula, and then the key point is you're going to do a limit. You're going to say what happens as this delta x gets smaller and smaller and smaller, because you can see the smaller it gets, the gradient gets closer and closer and closer to the true gradient. Okay, so this is what we're going to use. We're going to use this formula here. We're going to say the gradient dy dx is the limiting value as delta x goes to zero of y of x plus delta x minus y of x, and this bit is the change in x, x plus delta x minus x. Now, we're not going to dwell on mathematical subtleties, but you need to assume the limit exists and is well defined. And sometimes this limit does not exist. So here's an example. What you can see is if you take this particular point, then the gradient is not uniquely defined. Because if you approach from this side, you get one value, and if you approach from this side, you get another value. Now that's a subtlety for mathematicians on the whole, but it's something you just need to be aware of, that every now and then a function may not be differentiable at some points. So examples of using first principles then. So we're going to use this formula here. We're going to say the gradient, or rather the derivative dy dx, is the limiting value as delta x goes to zero of y x plus delta x minus y of x over x plus delta x minus x. So we'll start with a simple example. Let's take y equals x squared. And all we're going to do is plug this formula into here. So y of x plus delta x is here. You can see it's x plus delta x squared minus x squared of x plus delta x minus x. Now that's straightforward to expand out. You can all do that. And here's the answer. And what you'll notice is I have an x squared here and an x squared here, which cancel. So what you get left with in the numerator is 2x plus delta x in the brackets times delta x. Clearly those two are going to cancel. And then because delta x is tending to zero, this is going to be negligible compared to the 2x, and so you get the answer 2x. So the derivative of x squared is 2x. And you can use visual inspection to validate that this answer is sensible. So here's the curve, y equals x squared, and if, for example, you take x equals 1, then the gradient there, you'll find, is approximately 2. And you'll see that roughly works. If you take something like x equals 2, you'll find the gradient there is 4. So you'll see a quick visual inspection, you're getting the sort of answers you expect, so you know you've not made a gross error. Example 2, y equals x cubed. So we'll do the same trick as last time and just plug it into this limiting formula. So now we get this, x plus delta x cubed minus x cubed in the numerator, and I can multiply that out, and you get this big long expression here, which is a bit tedious, but you can do it. I can cross the x cubed and the x cubed there, which cancel, and I can also notice that delta x squared is much, much less than delta x, and delta x cubed is much, much less than delta x squared, and so on. So what's going to happen is I can eliminate this term, I can eliminate this term because they're far, far smaller than the 3x squared. I can cancel the delta x on the top and the bottom, and you get left with just 3x squared. And again, you could use a visual inspection to validate that this gives you a sensible answer. Different example then. What about y equals x to the n? Well, I can do the same trick here. I can plug it into my limiting formula. And there you see I've now got this x plus delta x to the power n. But when I've expanded this out, you'll notice I haven't included all the terms because I know all these other terms are going to be of the form delta x squared or delta x cubed. And so when I apply my limit, they're all going to be negligible compared to the other terms. I can also cancel the x to the n there and the x to the n there. And so what you get left with 
is just this n x to the n minus 1 in the brackets the delta x on the top and bottom cancel and so the answer is this n x to the n minus 1 different one what about sine a x well again all I've done is plug it straight into the formula so you can see here I've got sine of a x plus a delta x minus sine a x all divided by delta x now what I've got to do now is use my double angle formula from the trig so you'll see sine of a x plus a delta x gives you sine a x cos a delta x plus cos a x sine a delta x and then we've got minus sine ax on the right hand side. Next, if I look at limiting values, as delta x goes to 0, cos of a delta x goes to 1. As delta x goes to 0, sine of a delta x goes to a delta x. So what I'm going to do is plug that value in there and plug that value in there. So when I do that, you see what I get left with is sine ax times 1 plus cos ax times a delta x minus sine ax. So clearly that's sine ax and that sine ax cancel. That delta x and that delta x cancel. And you get left with a cos ax as the derivative of sine ax. Last example then, example 5 y equals e to the bx. So we can do the same sort of tricks here. We simply plug the formula in. We've got e to the bx plus delta x. Take out the e to the bx as a common factor and you'll see in the numerator I now have e to the b delta x minus 1. Now I'm going to use a particular observation which I won't prove but you may be aware of that the limit as delta x goes to 0 of e b to the delta x minus 1 is simply b delta x. So I can now plug that in there and you'll find therefore dy dx is the limit as delta x goes to 0 of e to the bx b delta x over delta x cancel the delta x's and there's your derivative b e to the bx. We can also look at log, and log is in fact the same as the previous slide. Because what I'm going to do is recognize that dy dx is 1 over dx dy. We'll cover that later under implicit if that's gone too quick for you here. If we do that, then instead of writing y equals log ax, I can write x equals 1 over a e to the y by recognizing that log and exponential are inverse functions one of another. So now I can just differentiate this, which is what I did in example 5. So you get dx dy equals 1 over a e to the y, or therefore dy dx equals a over e to the y. And then of course e to the y is ax, and you substitute all that in and you find dy dx is 1 over x. Now that's enough examples because in general what you're going to do is store all these results in a table of common results. So you look up at a table and it tells you what's the derivative of ax? What's the derivative of ax to the n? What's the derivative of sine bx or cos bx or tan bx or shine bx? log x and so on. So I've not given you them all here but a key thing you have to do is find a table which gives you the common results. Derive the ones you want to for your own comfort but as a general rule you can just use the table. So a summary. This video has introduced differentiation using first principles derivations. The derivatives of a few common functions have been given and you can use the same procedures to find derivatives for other functions but in general it's more sensible just to access a table of answers which have been derived for you. So later videos will start using these formula and the table and applying them.